Well, you could say that one speciality of 20th century missions was Bible translation. However, it seems virtually all pioneer Protestant missionaries were Bible translators. As we saw recently, William Carey is remembered as one of the first and most prolific of those who made Bible translation an accepted integral part of missionary work. However, there is one man who caused it to take on a new image as well as take it to a whole new level. Indeed, as linguistics became a science, William Cameron Townsend and the twin organizations SIL and Wycliffe Bible Translators became the largest independent mission agency in the world. Billy Graham called Cam or Uncle Cam, as he was known, the greatest missionary of our time. And Ralph Winter, who was the founder of the US Center for World Missions, ranked Cameron Townsend as one of the three most outstanding missionaries of the last two centuries. So who was William Cameron Townsend? Well, as his name suggests, he had Scottish ancestry, but he himself was born in California in 1896 during a difficult economic period. And much of his early life was really dominated, you could even say scarred by poverty. He was raised in the Presbyterian church and during his second year at college, he was challenged about missions by a visiting speaker, John R. Mott. He was very well known in his time. And within a short time, Cameron volunteered to go and sell Bibles in Guatemala, which is Central America, with the Central American mission. However, it was 1917, so that was the sort of second half of the First World War. And as a corporal in the National Guard, he knew he would be expected to join the war effort and felt it his duty to do so. Although he realized it would mean leaving missionary service to serve his country. However, that was not the opinion of a certain Miss Stella Zimmerman, who as a single missionary on furlough from Guatemala, told him to his face that she considered him to be a coward because he would be leaving women to do the Lord's work alone. Well, her rebuke persuaded Cam to apply for a discharge and much to his surprise, the army captain agreed to let him go, telling him that he would quote, do a lot more good selling Bibles in Central America than shooting Germans in France. So Cam left for Guatemala in August of 1917 and began a missionary career that would eventually span more than 50 years or half a century. At first, selling Bibles in Central America when so few were available seemed like a worthwhile ministry. But he soon discovered that much of his effort was being wasted since the tribe amongst whom he was working, the Kakichel Indians, who numbered about 200,000, couldn't read Spanish and their own language was still unwritten. And as he moved around and he began to pick up some elements of their language, he became burdened for the people who were not only slow to respond, but actually seem offended with his preoccupation to sell them Spanish Bibles. And this was brought home to Cam on one unforgettable day when an Indian asked him, why, if your God is so smart, hasn't he learned our language? That was a question that was not only to haunt him, but ultimately was used to change his life. 
You see, he was not only taken back by the question, but he actually went on to dedicate the next 13 years to learning their language proficiently, reducing it to writing, and finally, and most importantly, translating the scriptures. However, without any linguistic background or training whatsoever, he faced huge difficulties. For example, in their alphabet, the language had four different sounds for the letter K that to him sounded virtually the same. And verbs proved to be mind boggling. One verb, for instance, could have thousands of forms, including indicating the time and one's present location, plus many other additional features besides the simple action. It all seemed an impossible task until one day a fellow American told him that what he needed to do was to find the logical pattern on which the language was based and not try and squeeze it into the Latin mold. This advice changed the whole course of Cam's language study and led him to form a linguistic training program. Now, if you've been following this series, and this, by the way, is part 25, you will have discovered that almost all mission pioneers had strong personalities, strong wills, and independent streaks that could often clash with the more conservative workers and the authorities around them. Cam was a little different. And since the Central American mission he had joined promoted evangelism as their main aim, the fact that he wanted to concentrate on translation work caused difficulties, especially as the mission leaders did not feel the same concern as he did for the need to translate the Bible. So in 1929, after only 10 years of arduous work, Cam had completed the Kak Kichel New Testament. This milestone only served to confirm Cam in his belief of the need for widespread translation work. He became anxious to continue in translation work for other tribes whose language was still unwritten. But the Central American mission leaders felt he should remain with the Kat Kichel tribe. Just finding my place here, sorry about that. So, he decided that it wasn't going to work being part of the Central American mission uh, and working under the authority of others was always difficult for him. So it was this divergence in emphasis and outlook that was the factor that finally led his resignation. Prior to joining the mission, Cam had married Elvira another first term missionary serving in Guatemala. And while she was a competent missionary and she was a helpful addition with both the translation and the evangelistic work among the Indians, she failed to cope well with the inevitable frustrations that occur in missionary life and was at times considered to be emotionally unbalanced. And although she was able to take advantage of some professional counseling while they were on furlough back in California, it seemed to be of little long-term help. Her physical and emotional difficulties began to put a strain not only on the work, but also on the marriage. Cam blamed her problem on extreme nervousness. He said she loses control of herself 
and says and does painful things to me that are hurtful to our work. Nonetheless, despite the problems, they continued together in the work until her premature death in 1944 at the fairly young age of 52 years old. In 1934, he founded Camp Wycliffe in Arkansas. Now, it was named Wycliffe after John Wycliffe. He was a 14th century Oxford University professor and was promoter uh, of the first complete translation of the Bible into English. Really, Wycliffe was one of the forerunners of the Protestant Reformation. He said, quote, speaking, of course, of the Roman Catholic Church, as the faith of the church is contained in the scriptures, the more these are known in the true sense, the better. Believers should have the scriptures in a language familiar to people. Hence, Wycliffe Bible translators. Cap Wycliffe was described at the time as a very disorganized and unattractive venture. Yet from that unpromising beginning, it would grow to become quite remarkably the world's largest independent Protestant mission organization. And while Cam was basically an easygoing person, he was always keen to promote harmony among his fellow workers, especially when his twin organizations of Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Summer Institute of Linguistics, SIL, were frequently involved in controversy. The most common accusation was that he tried to gain entrance into a new country under false pretenses, while at the same time deceiving supporters back home. You see, the critics accused him and his organization of using underhanded means by falsely claiming, for example, to be secular language specialists or social workers teaching literacy, while to the supporters back home, they called themselves missionary Bible translators. The controversy became so heated that one older missionary returned from Central America to warn different churches about the quote, dishonesty and fakery of William Cameron Townsend. To gain entrance into some countries, Cam was criticized for seeming to be too friendly to socialist regimes and Roman Catholics. And when he developed a close working relationship with the president of Mexico and defended his socialistic programs, it was an anathema to many missionaries, especially to those from the United States. Unlike most missionary of his, missionaries of his time, Cam was happy to cooperate with Roman Catholics. He said, quote, it's possible to know Christ as Lord and Saviour and to continue in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the crisis came to a head when eventually a Catholic scholar applied to join Wycliffe. Cameron Townsend supported his inquiry, but actually was defeated by two thirds of the Wycliffe voting delegates. In 1948, he founded JARS, that's J-A-A-R-S, stands for Jungle Aviation and Radio Service. But when he decided to authorize pilots to fly on government missions, it alienated not only some of his own pilots, but also outsiders alike. Again, there was a concern about his use of Bible translators in government sponsored social programs, which was seen as a dangerous slide towards the social gospel. 
But I think we must ask, how can you have the Bible in your own language unless it is translated? And how can you read the translated Bible if you are illiterate and, un and uneducated? And how will you get educated if there are no schools and no literacy programs? Indeed, how would you be healthy without an understanding of basic sanitation and hygiene? And if you have an illness, how will you get physically better and recover without medication and access to a clinic or a hospital? And so the list goes on from everything from improving food production and digging wells to giving out spectacles and glasses because you can't see properly to read. I mean, another William, William Carey, faced similar criticisms. But I think today, except for a few narrow-minded diehards, this whole idea of dualism, the secular sacred divide, the spiritual gospel versus the social gospel mentality has almost gone. Another problem Cameron faced, and honestly, there, there's no sort shortage of problems that faced him, as you'll see. Another problem was regarding his relationship with other religious groups. How should Bible translators react to Roman Catholics? Should they share the results of their work with Roman Catholic priests, whose main goal, of course, was to expand the Roman Catholic Church? At that time, the vast majority of evangelical missionaries believed that there should be no cooperation whatsoever with Roman Catholic officials. But Cam took a different position. He said it's possible to know Christ as Lord and Saviour and to continue in the Roman Catholic Church. I am happy indeed if the translations are used by anyone and everyone. Well, the whole issue came to a head when a young Catholic scholar, Paul Vict, applied to become a translator with Wycliffe. He was a Christian believer engaged to a Salvation Army girl whose own view was that Bible truths always took priority over Roman Catholic dogma, although he believed he should remain a member of that church. Cam deliberately sent his own letter of total support for Paul Witt to the whole Wycliffe membership. Quote, we must not depart from our non-sectarian policy one iota if we are to keep entering countries closed to traditional missionary organisations. Well, in the event Witt was refused membership, by a two-thirds majority of the Wycliffe voting delegates. Cam was very upset with the result, but promised to personally support Witt and his new bride under some other sponsorship. But it was not only Roman Catholics that caused problems for Cameron and Wycliffe Bible translators. In 1949, the application of Jim and Anita Price led to a very heated debate because they were Pentecostals or hot gospelers, as they were sometimes unfairly described. While most members did not deny the sincere Christian commitment of this couple, nonetheless, they felt it would be incompatible with the non-charismatic evangelicals that filled the organisation. Cam, not surprisingly, again upheld the non-sectarian policy of Wycliffe, asserting that the theological issues under discussion were non-essentials, they were secondary issues. Furthermore, to deny this couple membership of Wycliffe, he said, would be to deny a whole tribe in Peru the privilege of having the scriptures in their own language. And then to really rack up and increase the pressure that he brought to bear on this argument, Cam threatened to resign his position as General Secretary of Wycliffe Bible Translators if the prices were rejected. 
Well, this time he won the battle. And since the price prices did not hold the view that speaking in tongues was essential for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they were accepted into membership of Wycliffe. Tolerance was very much part of Cam's nature, and this spirit spread to all aspects of the work, including that of race. During a time when evangelicals were defending segregation, he bucked the trend by appealing to blacks and Hispanics and other ethnic minorities to join Wycliffe. He was implacably opposed to racial prejudice. And in a letter to the board in 1952, he wrote, our constitution has nothing that savors of discrimination. You won't find it in the New Testament either. Please send along all the non-Caucasian workers you can, if they make good in the courses. And he was also unusually broad-minded for his time when it came to the issue of educational qualifications. Although many translators would go on to have advanced degrees, including PhDs, he opposed any attempt to make a college or seminary education a qualification or prerequisite for Bible translation work. Indeed, he didn't have a PhD, and while he himself was offered a number of honorary doctorates, he refused them all except one, so that he could maintain an affinity with those translators without degrees. Ruth Tucker wrote of him, Cam never quite fitted into the classic conservative mould from which the majority of his supporters and associates were formed. And although his own personal faith was never called into question, his methods were viewed with scepticism by many evangelical leaders. Yet another issue that caused controversy was that of single women working in pairs in remote tribal areas. The weaker sex could be exposed to special dangers. And initially, even Cam seriously doubted whether it was wise for single women to engage in remote tribal work. But when they challenged him, to explain why God would not protect and care for them in the same way that he cared and protected for men, Cam admitted they had a point and agreed there would be no restrictions on their service. And by the 1950s, there were several pairs of single women in remote areas who did extend outstanding work as Bible translators. One example would be the work of Loretta Anderson and Doris Cox, who worked in one of the most feared headhunting tribes in the jungles of Peru. The tribe was led by the infamous chief Tariri, who had acquired the position of chief by murdering his predecessor. Loretta and Doris later admitted that, quote, Although they were scared most of the time during the first five months, they buckled down to the agonizingly slow job of learning the language. Soon, they'd won the hearts of the people, including the chief, who began helping them as a language informant. And after only a few years, himself turned from witchcraft and murder and became a Christian, which of course set a wonderful example for many in the tribe who also followed him. Years later, he confided to Cam, if you'd sent me men, we would have killed them on sight. Or even if you'd sent a couple, I would have killed the man and taken the woman for myself. But what could a great chief do with two harmless girls who insisted on calling him 
brother. What better argument could Cam have to prove his point to his critics? That story vindicated the work of Wycliffe Bible translators. Cam, Uncle Cam, William Cameron Townsend disliked authoritarian leadership and he disliked any idea that he was the all powerful leader at the head of some pyramid organizational structure. And from the beginning of SIL, SIL, the summer training program that he began in Arkansas in 1934, to the surprise of Benny, Cameron proposed that he work under the executive committee of Wycliffe Bible translators and thus under the vote of the membership. This was revolutionary. One biographer said, this is something completely new in the history of missions. A founder director telling a crew of young green members, some of whom were unhappy with past decisions, to take charge. But Cam believed it was dangerous for one man to have complete control. He knew it would mean he would have to use persuasion and charisma to attempt to put across his policies. However, by sacrificing himself in this way, he found many of his new ideas never saw the light of day. And after one particularly heated debate, a committee member said, Uncle Cam is probably right. He may be 10 years ahead of the rest of us, as usual. Despite this, or maybe because of this, membership of Wycliffe grew rapidly over the course of the decades. And today, Wycliffe has more than 5,000 members working in more than 70 countries throughout the world. And while he was the founder and human dynamo behind the work, his approach to leadership meant that many others were able to make significant contributions, including Elaine, whom he married after the death of Elvira. Elaine was a school teacher from Chicago who at the young age of 27 had been promoted to a significant role that entailed the supervision of classes of mentally handicapped children in over 300 schools. The work was rewarding and held great promise, but she gave it all up to become the first teacher for Wycliffe Bible translator children in Mexico and would later conduct reading campaigns among more than a dozen tribes. 1946, she and Cam were married in the home of their friend, General Lazaro Cardenas, the ex-president of the country of Mexico. And for the next 17 years, they served in Peru, during which time their four children were born before they moved to Colombia to conduct translation work. So there we are. Although recognized throughout the world as a great missionary statesman, Cam always thought of himself first and foremost as a Bible translator. His key phrase he was always repeating was, with one more language to go. And to the surprise of many, after 50 years of ministry, rather than contemplating retirement, he prepared to go to the Soviet Union with Elaine, and at the age of 72, he could be found in a hotel in Moscow studying Russian for several hours a day. Once again, rather sadly, this attracted criticism from some quarters. One long-term supporter said, actually accused Elaine, Cam's wife, of having been taken in by the communists. So she replied like this. She said, we didn't go to the USSR to find fault. We went to see how we could serve and pave the way for the Bible to be translated into more languages.
When William Cameron Townsend died in April of 1982, almost 40 years ago, Bernie May spoke for the entire organization. Listen to this quote. When the word came that Uncle Cam was gone, I had the same feeling I've had on several occasions when flying a twin engine aeroplane and one engine suddenly goes dead. All at once, your goal becomes very important. You instantly turn to your guidance system. You keep on flying, but with a new intensity of reaching your destination as quickly as possible. There are still 3,000 languages without the Bible. This is our challenge. This is our call. And today, with greatly enhanced computer programs, translating the Bible into a new language can be done in much less time than it could in the time of Uncle Cam. The current aim of Wycliffe is that in the next 10 to 15 years, their goal is that 99% of all people will have the New Testament in their own language and 95% of all people will have the complete Bible in their language. As of today, Wycliffe has more than 2,700 translation projects in progress around the world. And can you imagine how many people that adds up to? Let me finish, just show you a few pictures of Uncle Cam. We can get these people, these pictures up. So I had these ready, but they... Right. There's a picture I just try and get it straight. There's Uncle Cam. And here's a picture of him. With his second wife, very beautiful lady, Elaine. And what great work he did. Let me just finish by giving you a little personal story of Bible translation and had working with translators. I was working in uh, Mexico City and I was preaching in a large church there. And I stood up to start my message and the church was packed full of people. So I said, I'm so glad to see the churches are full. And uh, I thought they'd be going, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And there was a deathly silence. I thought, well, what's gone wrong? And then as I heard in my memory what my translator had said, I'd heard him use a word tonto, Spanish word tonto. Now, I don't know what tonto means to you. To many of us, it just means that uh, American Indian guy who... Who, who worked with the Lone Ranger. But actually, Tonto is Spanish for stupid or crazy. So what he'd heard me say, my translator, is I'm glad to see the church is a fool. Which is very close, isn't it? To, in English, the saying, I'm very glad to see the church is a fool. Very little difference in the sound. But if I hadn't realized he'd used the word tonto and turned to him and said, no, 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 not the church is a fool. The churches are full of people. I guess they would have spent the whole of that sermon thinking, why is he insulting our church? So you have to really be careful when you have translators. I remember once preaching on the Doulos in Turkey. The ship Doulos was in the Bosphorus. And uh, I was uh, a speaker and unusually I didn't meet my translator until I was just about to speak. And this guy just came forward. I preached. The people seemed to be happy with what was going on, finished the message and the people all went off home. And then one of the women came up to me and she said, Gareth, she said, I'm afraid I've got to tell you something. 
that man was not translating you at all. He was preaching his own message. Well, I had no idea because I didn't speak any Turkish. So translation is a very important job and it's very important that it's done well. So there we are. Just a few little uh, stories for you. So maybe, Malou, if you could unmute everybody now, just to give us time to say our goodbyes. That would be great. I seem to have lost somehow the picture here, but uh, see if we can find it again. Cool. Well, I presume you're all there. I've lost the pictures of everybody. Are you all there? Maraming salamat. Ah, <laughs> 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 Yes, thank you. <laughs> Oh, bless you, Jolie. Salamat. And Elfa, Thank good you. to see you. I hope you had a good connection, and Elfa. Did you have a good yes. connection? It's a lot better. <laughs> Great yes. to see you all. Oh, there you are. Yeah, hi. Seen you for a long time. Yeah. Yes. So, as I say, good to see everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Colin. God bless you. And Diane. Yeah, yes. God bless Dave Rusty. You God bless what? you. What? But John and Iris, lovely to see you all. And uh, if you can join us next week and bring some people along as well, that would be really great. God bless you.